In this video, we are going to talk about the powerful human networks that run the world. We'll talk about how they can be, but often aren't, exercises in unaccountable power. And we'll reflect as well on what this has to say about certain claims made about modern day examples, such as, dare I mention it, the World Economic Forum. Let's dive straight in. There's a well-known saying that you'll be familiar with, it's not what you know, it's who you know. And that's a reflection on the truism that networks, human networks, make the world work. Now, of course, all of us are parts of networks. I mean, real networks are people who know each other rather than the shallow social media version. Family networks, friendships, old school networks, work colleagues, sports clubs, you name it. What only some people do, however, is to deliberately nurture their networks and seek to expand them to include the people who will be highly objective to their life objectives, their political objectives, or whatever it may be, their success. Of course, if you're born into families that are already important and well-connected, you start with a huge advantage. But it's a mistake, especially in relatively meritocratic countries like the US or even the UK, to presume that means you're stuck in your lane. One of my earliest influences when I was entering the world of work was a book written by Keith Ferrazzi, Never Eat Alone. Still have it to this day, in fact. Ferrazzi had none of those early advantages. He came from a solidly working class background. But from the beginning, he found ways to change the script. Starting as a youth when he caddied for people at the local golf club, and he went out of his way to help and support the people that he caddied for, some of whom were highly influential people. And he discovered that if you went beyond the usual to be helpful to someone, well, they would often reciprocate. The power of mutual support and reciprocation is really the superpower of successful people. And that's the message of the book. The interest of people getting together with people who are similar to themselves, seeking mutual benefit in some way, whether financially, politically, intellectually, artistically, is a process as old as human society. But as historian Neil Ferguson says in his book on the topic, The Square and the Tower, early societies were more rigidly hierarchical and historians largely focused on leaders and institutions where documentation is plentiful and they ignored the potential role of informal networks. Now, if hierarchy is the order of the day, you're only ever as powerful as your rung on the ladder. But that began to change with the arrival of the Enlightenment, a movement of intellectual renewal that largely took place outside of established institutions and hierarchies. Sometimes those networks could be formal, with a name and a membership. And a classic example is one that's inspired conspiratorial excitement through the ages, namely the Illuminati. Between 1776 and 1785, this secretive group of highly educated civic and intellectual leaders met in Bavaria, committed to replacing what they saw as ignorant and superstitious monarchism with more enlightened and educated ideals. It was secretive because said ignorant leaders would not appreciate that ambition, but its aim wasn't violent overthrow, but subversively spreading education and commitment to enlightenment to those that might become leaders of the future. It started out small in number, gradually growing to somewhere between 650 and 2,500 members. One member of the order said that its aims were to be an association that, through the most subtle and secure methods, will have as its goal the victory of virtue and wisdom over stupidity and malice, an association that will make the most important discoveries in all fields of science, that will teach its members to become both noble and great, that will assure them of the certain prize of their complete perfection in this world, that will protect them from persecution for fates and oppression, and that will bind the hands of despotism in all its forms. But even if the aim was education not overthrow, they kind of weren't messing about. If a member violated the oath of secrecy, they could be punished with the most gruesome death. 
And that wasn't self-indulgence, remember. This was a time when it was deeply dangerous to express ideas that challenged the status quo. So secrecy was essential. And maintaining the discipline of secrecy across a large group required elaborate systems and pretty, shall we say, unambiguous enforcement. And it worked for a while. By the early 1780s, the Illuminati network went throughout much of Germany, taking off after they followed the path of infiltrating German Masonic lodges, where there was a lot of discontent with how Freemasonry was developing at the time. A number of important German princes had joined, along with various noblemen. Johann Wolfgang Goethe was a member, along with various others. But eventually... The law of real conspiracies kicked in. The larger it gets, sooner or later, the cloak of secrecy is going to fall. In 1784, the Bavarian government had caught on to the fact something was up, and they issued a series of edicts to ban the Illuminati, condemning them as traitorous and hostile to religion. A commission was set up to root them out of government and academic institutions. Some fled. Some were exiled, others imprisoned, and that was the end of the fact of the Illuminati. It was just the beginning of the myth of the Illuminati, of course. And that started with a Jesuit priest, Augustin Barruel, who claimed that the excesses of the French Revolution Jacobins was because of the Illuminati. And he claimed that the Illuminati was following a mission to destroy Christianity and the church. And he described the founder, Weishaupt, as a human devil bent on malevolent destruction. As a named secret group, they were fodder for the imagination. They kept reappearing in various places whenever people needed something a bit more compelling to damn the networks of their enemies. And of course, such claims survive to this day because they play on people's fears about the networks of the powerful. In 2011, a survey of a thousand Americans found that just over half agreed with the statement, much of what happens in the world today is decided by a small and secretive group of individuals. Neil Ferguson complained about the added challenge this sort of attention provides for historians such as himself. The history of the Illuminati illustrates the central problem of writing books about social networks, especially those that seek to remain secret. Because the subject attracts cranks, it is hard for professional historians to take it seriously. And that's before you get to the practical problems, such as the fact that such networks generally don't, for obvious reasons, keep readily available archives making the act of tracing down the correspondence of actual known members a much more laborious task. Of course, the majority of networks through history have not been formal organisations with secret aims, but informal networks of like-minded people. From the 1500s, with the gradual arrival of the Reformation, leading to the Age of Enlightenment, the rigid hierarchy of established power came under assault by a lot of different types of networks. Now, on the one hand, the rise of entrepreneurialism, initially expressed in the form of adventurers looking to discover foreign lands to bring back what treasures they may find. And then secondly, the networks of ideas that began to spring up because of one specific invention, the printing press starting with Luther, whose original 95 Theses, a critique of the corrupt practices of the church, were printed and widely circulated, very much powering the Reformation, which led to massive disruption across Europe and forever changed the religious power landscape. Latterly, it drove the rose of the Enlightenment, networks focused on science and learning. It's often represented as a widespread phenomenon, People across the whole of Europe, at least, joined by the printed word. But analysis that's been conducted of the leading 18th century thinkers shows that they tended to be made up of much more national clusters. So Voltaire's network of more than 1,400 correspondents, the majority was French. 
Networks thrive particularly on direct human contact. Those French intellectual networks were supported by salonniers, women whose homes became centres for social meetings of like-minded thinkers, artists and philosophers. And in the UK particularly, this was supported by the creation of formal societies. So the Philosophical Society, founded in 1737 in Edinburgh, Scotland being an early hub with the likes of Adam Smith and David Hume. The US was well removed from all of this activity. And it's worth reflecting on how, for instance, the great Benjamin Franklin went about having to create his own network. So in 1727, he formed the Junto, a club for like-minded men to meet and discuss. Two years later, he published the Pennsylvania Gazette and in 1731 set up the first American subscription library. Then later, he founded the American Philosophical Society, all about attracting people similar-minded to himself. And this was as good as he could do in Philadelphia, which at the time had a population of just 25,000 people. It was only after he was able to travel to London that he started to find his true colleagues in the Enlightenment network. And all of that was before the Americans fought their war of independence. Now, it shouldn't be a huge surprise that that event also had a lot more to do with networks than is usually related in the standard telling. One theory, first argued by Sidney Morse in 1924, was that Freemasonry was one of the important networks that was the bedrock of the American Revolution. And particularly important were certain individuals who were strong network hubs and provided a bridge between otherwise unconnected but important locational networks, like Paul Revere, who was one of two men who crossed the class divide between artisans and professionals. He was also a Freemason and became a deputy grandmaster of the Massachusetts Grand Lodge. 68 of the founding fathers were indeed Freemasons. Eight of the signers of the Declaration of Independence were likewise. Now those are minorities. 68 out of 241, 8 out of 56. And there were certainly some in Masonic lodges that were loyalists on the other side. But Neil Ferguson points out that the Founding Fathers were not all equal in their importance. And network analysis has shown that some of the key ones, particularly in Boston, were indeed Freemasons. Benjamin Franklin became a Grandmaster of his lodge in Philadelphia. George Washington joined a lodge in Virginia at the age of 20 and so on. None of that meant that the Freemasons organisationally directed the revolution or any of the sorts of things loved of the conspiracy theorists, just that the values of the network were conducive to bringing together those that would share those ideas, often the way these networks really work. And that's an important thing about them to remember. The existence of human connection is far more common in our own lives and through human history than is the existence of a shared secret purpose or any of the stuff of conspiracies. There are always networks, very rarely real-life conspiracies. But what's also very common is the innate suspicion of people outside of networks and what they have towards what might be going on in the inside going all the way back to Adam Smith's famous comment that people of the same trade seldom meet together even for merriment and diversion, but the conversation ends in a conspiracy against the public or in some contrivance to raise prices. And they don't always exist in exactly the way that you might expect. The writer Anthony Trollope wrote about Victorian politicians who would publicly attack each other in the House of Commons and then share confidences in the London clubs to which they all belonged. And that's the sort of behaviour that comes of people who actually have more in common with each other, by dint of them being parliamentarians, than they have with people on the outside. But for those people on the outside, it's exactly the sort of thing that gets them rather worried about what are the rules of this cosy club anyway. 
Neil Ferguson wrote this, The suspicion grows that the world is controlled by powerful and exclusive networks. The bankers, the establishment, the system, the Jews, the Freemasons, the Illuminati. Nearly all that is written in this vein is rubbish. Yet it seems unlikely that conspiracy theories would be so persistent if such networks did not exist at all. The problem with conspiracy theorists is that, as aggrieved outsiders, they invariably misunderstand and misrepresent the way that networks operate. In particular, they tend to assume that the elite networks covertly and easily control formal power structures. My research, as well as my own experience, suggests this is not the case. So let me talk about one nugget of my own experience in this area. The organisation I used to work for, Business in the Community, was a membership club for companies that were committed in some way or another to what you could broadly describe as social responsibility. While I was there, it worked powerfully because it acted as a network for the chief executives, the other top executives of the biggest companies in the country. Now, we could talk about how that worked, which is quite interesting, but there was one specific thing that is particularly relevant to this discussion. Working at BITC, you often got invited to events, networks, training, things that you wouldn't otherwise have done. One of the things was that I got to go on a thing called Common Purpose. Now, Common Purpose was, and still is, I think, an organisation that encourages enlightened leadership, that understands how to work cooperatively across private, public and voluntary sectors. Training leaders to care about their communities, to understand how those communities work, and give them the chance to build their own network outside of their own field. Private sector building a network with public sector and so on. The way this worked was that you spent one day per month for six months, maybe, might be nine months, where you had a themed day, presentations and discussions, from some of the people who were central to how the local area worked. Each group, which stayed the same throughout the programme, was made up of people who were nominated by their bosses as leaders of the future. Plus me. I'm always one or two that sneak in. And a third of each of the group came from the private sector, a third from the public sector, a third from the charitable sector or civil society. It was kind of an interesting programme. For instance, when we had the Crime Day, it included a visit to the prison in Leeds where we got to discuss why there was such a high reoffending rate and we talked to some of the prisoners. I mean, really interesting stuff. Not the sort of stuff you normally get to do. And then it was over. Now, I was startled to discover a few years ago, long after I'd done the programme, that it had become the focus for a conspiracy theory. Let me read for you the first few paragraphs on the topic of common purpose from an entry on WikiLeaks that dates back to the Tony Blair government. Exact date unknown. Although it has 80,000 trainees in 36 cities, 18,000 graduate members and enormous power, common purpose is largely unknown to the general public. It recruits and trains leaders to be loyal to the directives of Common Purpose and the EU instead of to their own departments, which they then undermine or subvert, the NHS being an example. Common Purpose is identifying leaders in all levels of our government to assume power when our nation is replaced by the European Union in what they call the post-democratic society. They are learning to rule without regard to democracy and will bring the EU police state home to every one of us. Can't say I'd notice anything like that going on. And you'd think that if it was such a powerful group with that master plan, they would have prevented Brexit. It's interesting how rather ordinary things become sinister when pushed through that sort of lens. For instance, in a number of these things, they often run on the basis of what are called Chatham House Rules. These are designed to encourage people to share and speak openly for the benefit of greater dialogue and understanding. They basically mean that views should not be attributed to named individuals, although the views can be reported, which means people feel freer to speak. 
that suddenly becomes a dark indicator of secrecy. Trained leaders are encouraged to act as a network, enable other members' plans and have meetings under the so-called Chatham House rules. This effectively means their statements are not attributable to them, nor can attendees reveal information heard at a common purpose meeting. That last part is wrong. The point of the Chatham House rules is that yes, you can talk about information, you just can't do it in a way that fingers can be pointed at an individual for saying something they shouldn't have done. If you follow some of the things that are said today about the World Economic Forum, you will recognise similar patterns. And in some ways that's not surprising. Both organisations are focused on encouraging public-private sector partnerships on issues of public importance. So if you can see that through a lens to make it seem sinister at the city level, which is the level at which common purpose works really, how much more can you do the same at the global level? Of course, the WEF is materially different in other ways because it pulls together some of the most powerful global leaders of today. Can something like that evolve into something else? Well, of course it can, in all sorts of ways. But if you want something to be truly nefarious, you wouldn't begin with something aiming to be very public about doing something good in the world. Because that mission attracts at least some of the sort of people who then wouldn't put up with the nefarious when they discovered it. When people look at such networks and assume people are all signing up to some surreptitious unified mission, they are vastly overestimating the power of rather loose networks of strong individuals to achieve anything like that. Now, you can attract people with a broad-based proposition, such as, it's good if businesses and governments can cooperate on areas of social benefit where it makes sense for them to do so. Governments will particularly love that because of the idea that they can get business resource involved means that they can get more benefit without it coming from public spending to which they're held accountable. The attractiveness of such a proposition is why you get so many government leaders and others making an appearance. Not because they're taking orders from Klaus Schwab, because what will be in it for them? What has Klaus Schwab got that they need? But because the best connected network in the world is the WEF, bringing together the wealthiest billionaires who happen to be open to public-private partnerships. If you were them, why wouldn't you go there? And so it becomes a sort of melting pot forum for all sorts of agendas and deals and pitches. For example, Neil Ferguson talks about a World Economic Forum summit that was where Nelson Mandela newly released from prison, came to understand that while he'd been incarcerated, modern communist states had moved on from seeking ownership of the means of production. He didn't pick this up from the West, although he may have heard it, but he didn't take it from them. He took it from the Soviet and the Chinese representatives at the WEF. The ANC was committed to communism, remember, so for someone like Mandela exposure to a wider network of people who shared some of those sorts of things in common with him decades ago, but they had learned from experience since, that was immensely important. Does that mean that a forum like the WEF must be necessarily benign? Well, not at all. Powerful billionaire technocrats coming together to discuss how the world's problems could be solved by them. It may be benign and productive. It may well be arrogant and damaging. The point is, how would you know? Because what it isn't is a democratic and accountable forum. The main sessions may be public, videoed and freely available, but the more private and exclusive discussions that were obviously going to be taking place certainly were not. Just like most networks through history, in fact. The key is to pay attention to what actually comes out of it, rather than some of the excitable nonsense that gets written about random guest blog posts on their website. And let's be clear, sometimes networks can be seriously against the public interest, particularly when there is an obvious short-term self-interest from its members and where there is power in a herd-like effect. So again, Neil Ferguson talks about the time when George Soros, a man who's the target of many a conspiracy theory, was supposed to have single-handedly broken the Bank of England. Now, of course, a single man almost certainly can't do that, but a herd might be able to. So this was a time when Britain was trying to keep the pound in the European exchange rate mechanism because the government was committed to supporting the currency if it dropped below a certain level. 
it was vulnerable to the action of currency speculators. Hedge fund manager Soros had built his quantum fund over the previous two decades and knew well that the system of fixed exchange rates could provide a massive return if it could be broken. If his quantum fund, and crucially other hedge funds, bet heavily enough against the currency, it would weaken regardless of the economic fundamentals of the country and the economy that issued it. Now Soros alone could never have made that happen. And he reflected on this himself. He said, most of the time I am a trend follower, but all of the time I am aware that I am a member of a herd and I am on the lookout for inflection points. Most of the time the trend prevails. Only occasionally are the errors corrected. It is only on those occasions that one should go against the trend. When they analysed the situation, Soros took a fateful decision to go all in against the pound, so-called short selling it. So he and his partners began borrowing as many pounds as they could. And the point was this, as one of his collaborators noted, I walked out there with absolutely no question that we were going to go after this thing. And I knew other people in the banks and counterparties would imitate us. And they did. The Bank of England tried to fight back, raising interest rates to 12% and then just three hours later to 15%, but it was hopeless. And the pound was devalued the next day, crashing out of the ERM and actually in the event signalling the beginning of the end of John Major's government. Neil Ferguson concluded with this, that George Soros is a hub in a large and powerful network has often been claimed by conspiracy theorists. According to one breathless account, he is the visible side of a vast and nasty secret network of private financial interests controlled by the leading aristocratic and royal families of Europe centred in the British House of Windsor and built upon the wreckage of the British Empire after World War II. This is, he adds, nonsense. The real network Soros belongs to is a network of hedge funds seeking to make money in similar ways. Intricate plans and secret meetings were simply not needed. Common interest, herd instinct was all that was required. So yes, as an outsider to some of the most powerful networks, it is highly appropriate to be keenly interested and suspicious about how they work and to whose benefit. But as always with such things, you will only do well if you can see the situation clearly rather than obscuring your view with either blanket cynicism or indeed creatively joining dots together that simply don't actually join up. So look, that's quite a journey. From Keith Ferrazzi, who discovered that positive networks where you go out your way to help others can change your life for the better, to then some of the big powerful networks in history and in the modern world, which can be benign or, if not malevolent, then self-interested without care to the consequences. Like every other aspect of human society, it can be used for good. It's arguably what made human beings so successful in the first place. It's certainly central to how you can make an impact in the world if you're trying to do so. It can be used, however, for harm. So let's focus on how we could improve our own personal approach to the former and keep a sober, fact-focused and unfanciful eye on those who might be engaged with the latter. By the way, I've referred to the World Economic Forum in passing in this video. I did do a full video on the ideas that actually come through the WEF, why some of the memes about them weren't entirely correct, but some of the ideas might be problematic. If you're interested in that strand, you might want to watch that video next.